Um, okay, I guess we'll get started. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Pope. I'm a, uh, a web developer and uh, DevOps enthusiast. And uh, for the past few years, I've been doing contracts, doing uh, sort of development and network systems, back-end systems, that kind of thing. So I'm here to talk about GEvent. GEvent is a framework for asynchronous I.O. with a fully synchronous programming model. So uh, you may be familiar with things like Tornado and Twisted and the new async I.O. in Python 3.3 and 3.4. And uh, GEvent is a sort of direct competitor to that. And I hope to demonstrate that it's uh, easier to use and more flexible than any of those things. Um, so, uh, where this talk is, is going, so we're, first of all, we'll meet uh, G-Event um, and see some examples, uh, and then I'm going to discuss the theory behind G-Event and the, uh, the other, uh, so Tornado and Twisted and Ace and Kyo and how they compare and the programming models involved, um, and then I uh, might talk briefly about my experiences with G-Event. Um, so asynchronous uh, or evented or non-blocking I.O. is uh, any form of strategy for writing network programs where um, instead of blocking and your, your program suspending and waiting for a response for the I.O. operation that you've requested, the program goes away and does something else and resumes to the point that, or to, resumes executing your code uh, after the I.O. operation is completed. Um, so, diving into G-Event, this is uh, a very simple G-Event program. Um, so, uh, um, to talk through the code, uh, the only G-Event component we're using here is um, the stream server. Uh, we pass in a connection handler and then for any connection uh, that is received on that port, uh, the Connection handler is called. Uh, make file is uh, a, a feature of socket, and uh, obviously, so we're just echoing back lines. So it, make file turns it into a file-like object. Can iterate that for lines and send them back over the same socket. So that's very similar to the code that you might write with uh, with plain plain Python uh, before 3.3. If you were picking up async IO, um, except that some magic happens so that, that is highly scalable. Um, so we'll talk about the magic later. Um, this is, uh, so this is a, a client that uses G-Event, um, and what we're using here is URL lib to read 100 URLs uh, on a pool of uh, 20 thread-like objects, greenlets. Um, so those things are happening more or less in parallel, so that when the, somewhere in the middle of URL lib, URL lib 2, we uh, access a URL, it does some, some blocking to read data from that URL, um, but while that's happening, and while data is being received, other things are scheduled and run. So the, the clever thing here, uh, apart from the, so this pool object, uh, is that we are able to use URL lib 2 unmodified, because of the first two lines where we do some clever monkey patching. Um, and people uh, keep saying, oh, monkey patching, that's, that's a bit nasty. Um, and I, I'll explain a bit later why I think it's, it's actually rather elegant rather than rather ugly. Uh, so uh, another example, I actually had, uh, I could execute these examples, but we probably don't have time and the network uh, might not be working. so. It, an echo server is not particularly fascinating to look at. A chat server, more so, but um, but yeah, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't be able to connect to my machine. So, um, what's happening here? We've got uh, reader and writer, uh, well, greenlets effectively. So, what we're going to do is run each of those uh, reader and writer objects in a single greenlet. So they will be happening effectively concurrently. Um, and the uh, reader is just reading lines from a file and rebroadcasting them. We've got a system of queues so that a broadcast can go to all of the subscribe users. Um, and the second part of this is the code that 
hooks it together. So after receiving a connection, uh, again, this is sort of hosted with the, the stream server. After receiving a connection, uh, we turn it into a file. Read name is a function that I've not uh, included in this where we just read one line that is your username and loop until it's a, a valid username. Uh, and then uh, create a queue for the user and split out onto two greenlets to actually just do one direction of the, the communication at a time and the, the join all and, and the try finally uh, ensure that uh, the, those greenlets, when they, because greenlets raise an exception if the connection's lost, uh, it will just remove the user when the connection's lost. Um, so uh, moving on to, to some theory. Um, so talking about async in Python, the, the first thing I need to talk about is synchronous I.O. So this is a, a diagram of a call stack. Um, and obviously, call stacks can be arbitrarily deep. So I've got an example of uh, a simple call stack where we want to ooh, get, some, uh, <laughs> get some data. And that data is, uh, so I don't know, we're going to process that data in the green function. And uh, we want to do one I.O. Opera operation, which is read one line from something, uh, a socket probably, maybe a pipe. Um, so in synchronous I.O., uh, we, we actually, the, the code executes following the arrows, get to the point where we block on I.O. and nothing happens. Our process, from our point of view, the process it just stops dead. Uh, and the kernel then waits for I.O. and resumes us when that I.O. is ready. So in fact, uh, it may block more than once. Um, but the, everything stays completely intact, and uh, the execution continues when the I.O. is complete. And obviously, then, uh, the, the line can be returned to the caller, which will do some processing, and you know, the, the data is got. Um, so problems with, uh, with this kind of model in Python uh, the, the performance is, is not good, and the memory usage is not good. So there is an excellent uh, article which I actually failed to include a URL for. So click that hyperlink. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, well, Google that. Um, but, uh, but it turns out that threads in Python, um, the, the gill is not a kernel level object, exactly. So threads fight for the CPU, CPU attention. So, it's actually much, much worse than threads in other languages. Um, so there's also uh, stack memory. So a thread, um, the kernel knows about threads, and it prepares a bunch of stack um, that you, well, you, you can control it with u limit minus s, but it prepares the stack uh, ready to, to do stuff in C, basically. So not particularly useful for Python. You can turn that limit quite down quite low. but uh, you won't be able to get high scalability. And similarly with processes, you, you've immediately lost the shared memory space, which is useful about threads. And you don't, the, it, a thread is, is basically a lightweight process. They're, they're very similar kernel level objects. Um, yeah, so uh, I already mentioned this kind of model, but the, the um, what we're trying to do in all of these IO systems, asynchronous IO systems, is uh, when we are doing some I.O., we want to jump out of what we're doing to let other things run. And so that usually means uh, there is a central place, where it, it always means there is a central place that is waiting on I.O., doing all of the waiting for all of the, uh, all of the, the things that are processing I.O. at that moment and resuming the right one when something happens. So uh, I've... This, this is what it might look like. So um, people were saying uh, last night, don't, don't use select, it doesn't scale. But, but effectively, all of the alternatives to select are, are just sort of API improvements. Uh, but the, the fundamental code will look a bit like this. So something registers to, to want to wait on a file descriptor for read or wait for write. And then an event loop will be started, which resumes, for some definition of the function resume, uh, <coughs> when that file descriptor has uh, the capability to do, to do that operation. So if we register a waiter to wait for data being able to read, uh, select will return uh, the, a list of file descriptors um, that are uh, 
that on which you would then be able to when so select blocks sorry select blocks when it returns it returns those lists read write error and uh, each of the, the items in that list is a file descriptor and uh, so for every item in the every file descriptor in the list read it's guaranteed that you'll be able to read some number of bytes which I think is like 512 or something so there is at least 512 bytes in the buffer to, to be read at that point um, and uh, error handling uh, obviously error handling is is actually very important in network operations, so uh, I've omitted it for brevity, but similar thing applies. And then uh, this is the, the same thing, but sort of slightly modified to show the timeout, how the timeout part uh, loops, uh, interacts with that. So you may be wanting to do IO and blocking on IO, but you also might want to be just blocking for an arbitrary amount of time. Um, so you could say wait for timeout and then the last argument to select is a time that we want to suspend and if no if nothing is returned on read write and error uh, for the duration of that timeout then uh, select will return anyway and we could do some uh, process all of the things that we're waiting for timeout um, right so get into uh, uh, different models of what resume might mean. Um, and so callbacks are the simplest approach. They're, they're used in uh, JavaScript, uh, Tornado IO streams, Twisted Deferred, and Async IO all have this idea of callbacks from the event loop. Um, so this is the kind of uh, what this does to the stack. So whereas before we had a nice uh, simple definition of what get data, uh, like get data was, was one thing. Now I had to break it in two. We've had to break the, the, the read line function in two to, to do the bit that sets up the getting the line and the bit that receives the line and, or waits for a whole line perhaps. So um, this is a lot more messy. And uh, I, you notice that I've drawn the return values as sort of, uh, or the return paths as, as light arrows because you can't do anything useful with the return values of callbacks. They're not going to a useful place. They're not going to contain any useful data. Um, so there is actually no way to ever break out of the cycle of call, callbacks and just turn into nice code where we can return values, which is a really convenient way of programming. Um, so uh, I've included some examples of callbacks. This is an imaginary HTTP library uh, where uh, I'm making a request to, a, to a, an endpoint and passing in the function that I want to be called and uh, it's got the ability to load JSON and, and then so because I can't return it I've got to do something I've got to call back another callback with the the response um, and then if I wanted to link the request that I'm doing to a particular state of, well, you know, pass arguments, effectively, uh, then there's, there's more than one way of doing it, but one way is to use closures. So uh, the handle response is bound to the, uh, the, the, where it's closed over beer ID, so it knows what beer ID is, um, which I've not used. Oh, I've used callback instead, sorry. Um, but sort of more practical things. This is uh, this is something that I encountered a couple of years ago. This is Pico, which is an AMQP library, uh, and uh, uh, here we're sort of four levels of callbacks deep. Uh, and uh, this is a simple example. So, uh, in fact, this just declares a queue, but you might want to declare an exchange and bind a queue to an exchange. So you're sort of six layers of callbacks deep before you've actually received a message. So I don't like that at all. Um, that's that's really ugly to me. Um, so somebody once said, and I don't know, I don't have an attribution for this quote, but callbacks are the new go-to. Um, and uh, we discussed how it's, uh, the, it's an untidy code structure where you've split everything into tiny little component parts and you, you're, you're not able to do return values. And also error handling, you notice that the, the previous example there's absolutely no error handling in there. And if I wanted to do error handling for all of those operations, I might want to register an error handler. In fact, Pika, you register the error handler once and then it just arbitrary. It, some error happens somewhere in the program. But error handling with callbacks doubles the amount of work that you're doing. So, um, so people don't and the examples don't and then people copy the examples and error handling is just left on the floor. 
Um, so a, sim a simple approach to dealing with the complexity of callbacks is uh, binding them into a class so that you have, uh, so rather than having the, the closure as I demonstrated earlier, you have a class that has uh, method, uh, sorry, members and, and methods and things, and the methods, certain methods, are pre-registered as callbacks for certain operations. So uh, this is uh, something that I wrote once, uh, a bit truncated perhaps, but um, this is a twisted application uh, wrapping a subprocess and out received and er received get called whenever there is a chunk of data. Um, for some reason, the process protocol doesn't let you turn it easily into lines, so I had to write that. Uh, and then how do we break out of the, the, this, this handler that's getting events called, uh, events, the, sorry, methods are being called on the, the object. How do we turn that into useful things in another part of the program? Had to use something called a deferred queue. I don't really remember the semantics of it, but again, that's, that's uh, you, you register callbacks into it, I think. So you're just, this is just a, sim a simplification of some of the difficulties of callbacks, but it doesn't really deal with the problem. And uh, you end up using callbacks anyway, and you still have to split your processing into multiple chunks. So if I wanted to, um, so say I'd, so I'm doing self.q.put here, but if I was to decode the lines at that point and try and do another asynchronous operation, how would I link that asynchronous operation, which is another class, to this class? Uh, I've got to I do it using callbacks, basically. Um, and here's an example from asyncio. Uh, so it's exactly the same kind of thing. Um, the, there's underlying a system of callbacks, but uh, in async IO, you have protocols and transports uh, that are paired together. So your transport is wrapping uh, a type of thing like a, uh, like a uh, well, a subprocess or a network connection or something like that, an SSL connection. And the protocol is uh, the processing for that. But so it's still callback based, but you can your your uh, wrapping it in a class and in, in, there's a slightly, I suppose, I think it's a slightly nicer API where, where Twisted, I had to use a, a process protocol um, and that would be different to a, a protocol that goes over the wire. It's a very hard to understand, I don't know if you can speak a little more clearly into the mic. I mean, oh, sorry. Okay, okay, right, I'll try, I'll try to do that. Um, okay, sorry, where was I? Uh, yeah, so I think the async IO is slightly nicer than the, uh, the than twisted because the protocols and the transports are um, are kept separate, whereas in twisted they've been combined. Um, but the same problems apply. So um, so then we get into uh, a more modern technique. Of generator-based coroutines. So um, this is uh, this is present in Tornado. Uh, there's a Tornado.gen module, and this is the, uh, the I suppose the key feature in the new async IO in Python 3.4. Um, and so what we're doing here is um, uh, we're using uh, generators, which so a generator, when generators were introduced, it was noted they provide coroutine-like features. And a coroutine um, is, is really what, what uh, G-Event is built on. But uh, in this case, we are using, so we're, we're trying to suspend operation uh, between the, in the place that, in the, the earlier example of blocking I.O., uh, we would have let the operating system call us back we are using yield and yield from to break out of the stack while preserving those stack frames. Um, and the event loop will, and because the event loop is the parent, the event loop knows that we're waiting for something to happen uh, and it will return us back to the point, it will reassemble the stack um, when that operation is complete. So, uh, so there's, there's literally a division in the middle where the stack is torn down and uh, preserved as generator objects um, and, and resumed using send. 
Um, and there is uh, one of the advantages of this method is that you can actually return data. So uh, in in Python 3.4, where does it yield from? 3.3. So before Python 3.3, you couldn't actually return a value. You've, you've used generators. Uh, generators uh, in earlier Python, you could not have a yield and a return of a value. Um, so that was a feature that had to be added uh, to make this work. Um, and also, you've used the, the yield. So the semantics of yield are now coupled to breaking out of the stack, rather than being able to actually use generators as a useful sort of looping tool. Uh, so this is an example of async IO and using those coroutines. That, so this is a very similar example to the, to the stack that, uh, that I showed there. Um, for some reason, Sphinx wasn't able to highlight something with yield from in it. Um, but uh, so, uh, so the asyncio.sleep is a special type of generator that, uh, that returns an object that when, when it's, uh, sorry, yields an object that when it's yielded all the way through print sum back to uh, the event loop, the event loop will resume that generator uh, by going back through the, the print sum, or sending to print sum, sending from uh, the, the yield from line into the yield from async IO sleep line and, uh, and resuming the, uh, or letting async IO dot sleep return effectively. Um, and this is what it looks like in Tornado. Um, so Tornado has, uh, Tornado works on Python 2. Um, so uh, there is no yield from, there is no return value, but, um, that's, yeah, it's, it's usable in Python 2 as well. But you notice that uh, we've had to put yields into the code where really it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense that we're yielding. So what is an actual coroutine? So uh, generators have been described as, uh, or the approach uh, of generators has been described as semi-coroutines, a full coroutine, um, can yield not just to the calling frame, but to anywhere. So any other um, coroutine. Um, and it doesn't require any collaboration from the other stack frames to do that. So uh, the, the top level of the stack frame could just say, hold on, park me, I'm going to call back to the event loop. Um, so this is a bit what, what it looks like. So without having to suspend the, the stack frame or modify the calling conventions to use yield from, we get to the point at which we block and we just say yield to this event loop and the event loop, when it's ready to, uh, to resume, yields back to the point at which the, this greenlit was suspended. So uh, it's like blocking in the blocking IO example, except instead of blocking at the kernel level, we just suspend this greenlit, yield to the event loop, um, and the event loop does what the kernel would have done, which is wait for IO and resume us. So going back to the async IO example, uh, this, is, this is how the same, uh, the same piece of code would be written with gevent, um, rather than having to use yield from. Uh, so the only, the only difference in terms of what you're calling is you're calling gevent.sleep. Um, you don't need to use yield from, you write the code exactly as you would normally write it. And somewhere in gevent.sleep, the magic happens where it yields to the event loop. And here, I'm not even kicking it off from an event loop. So the fact that I'm using gevent.sleep, um, gevent.sleep will create the event loop if it doesn't exist. So uh, the, there's no, I don't have to be spawned by an event loop. Um, so much simpler. Um, yeah, so I've, I've, I think I've said most of those things. Uh, in, yeah, so in uh, GEVENT, the event loop is called a hub. Um, so let me get back to the monkey patching. Um, so it's possible to just use 
gevent.monkey to modify the existing sleep function, the time.sleep function, uh, which means, so you have to do that before you import anything, but uh, in case you keep references to the old versions, but it means that any existing code can run without modification. So you probably have code somewhere that uses time.sleep. Um, you can make it run using gevent just by starting your program with gevent.monkey import patch all, patch all, or however you want to express that. Um, or maybe have a launcher that launches your program with gevent, uh, which is an approach that's often used for something like, um, so it's, it's available in gunicorn, you could just say use a gevent worker, and it will do all of that stuff before your program starts. Um, so to tackle the, uh, the nastiness of monkey patching, uh, I don't think it's, it's that ugly in this case, because we're not, arbitrarily monkey patching bits of the standard library at random times. We're just starting, we're starting Python with a completely different distribution of the, the standard library that happens to be cooperative multitasking with, with gevent. Um, it's, it's, it's bundled as a library it's, rather than having like a Python hyphen gevent program. Uh, it's bundled as a library so you can choose to use it or not uh, in different ways of calling your code. So for example, you might have a, uh, a batch job that runs, um, uh, a batch job that runs uh, without asynchronous code because it doesn't need it. Um, and it, you want to do some, uh, I don't know, CPU stuff or it, it, yeah, simplify your code by not doing, as or a test, tests are actually better. You don't want to do asynchronous networking stuff in tests. So you might call your business logic um, as, as normal code and have it run synchronously and uh, then uh, just when, you're, when you switch into production you're using um, uh, gevent to do the asynchronous, uh, and asynchronous networking so uh, and obviously you do integration tests with actually running through gevent and that kind of thing. Um, but it's, uh, it's optional to use this, you can use the full power of gevent without doing it, it just means that you can't use existing pure Python libraries so I think that's a, a massive advantage um, you, you, as I say here, you can't use it if you're, if you're writing a gevent library, you should not rely on monkey patching being present because you don't, you don't know if the, uh, the caller of your library is going to want to do the monkey patching. Um, so the monkey patching also works with async code using select. So that immediately means that you can use uh, existing libraries that are doing their own kind of networking, so uh, that, that will have their own event loop, like Pika there. You could use Pika if you really wanted to deal with all of the callbacks. Um, but you need to ensure that it's using the select, uh, the select function rather than ePoll or KQ or any of the other more um, platform-specific alternatives that are, that are usually better. Um, so, just to quickly run through the kind of uh, features in, in GEVENT, you obviously need to be able to spawn a greenlet to allow concurrent operations that don't block each other. So, the, the, the fundamental unit of, uh, of, of processing I.O. with GEVENT is to have these greenlets. You spawn greenlets to do each side of a, uh, like a reading and writing side. You can kill greenlets by passing uh, an exception so that when the greenlet is resumed, uh, or, sorry, signal that greenlet to be immediately resumable, uh, but when it resumes, that exception will be raised. So that's actually an advantage over threads because you can't easily do that with threads in Python. Um, and then uh, there's, a, there's a greenlet pool equivalent to multiprocessing.pool or um, other types of pools. So if you wanted to do uh, parallelized network operations, that's an easy way to do it. Um, and then there's synchronization primitives to ensure concurrency between, or to, to, to ensure synchronization between your, your greenlets. Um, it's worth noting that greenlets never run at the same, actually at the same times, unlike threads. So these things are slightly less important, um, but you're, because you, you know that you're never going to give up control of the CPU until you hit a blocking operation. Um, and message passing async result is, is pretty neat. Uh, so you block on a single operation. That's a useful way of turning callbacks back into synchronous programming. So you want to have a synchronous programming model because it makes it easier. So async result, you could just say, when this callback's raised, set a value into this async result. And that gives you something that you could block on as a sort of just get 
uh, you do async result.get and it will return you the result. Or if there's an exception, you set the exception and the, the thing that's waiting on it will actually receive the exception. So um, synchronous error handling as well. And this is an example of using the, the thread killing, the greenlit killing mechanism. So you can just use a context manager like that and you've automatically got a, a timeout on the, the contained section. So uh, any timers uh, like time.sleep or uh, all blocking operations could be limited by the same timeout. Um, and we've already met things like the stream server, but there are whiskey servers and that kind of thing. Um, so uh, I think I've kind of covered this in a, in a way, but um, you can have business logic that's completely unaware of GEvent and unaware of the, the grid, even without the monkey patching. You can have business logic that's unaware of asynchronousness, and you pass in, say, a file-like object which has been made green and uh, it will, the, the business logic will, will uh, hit that and stop without having to change all of your call stack to collaborate in doing this, this yield from shenanigans to get back to the event loop to be resumed eventually. So I think that's a, that's a huge advantage and I don't really want my business logic to be, to, to have the idea of asynchronous uh, backends potentially being, being part of it and also have to deal with uh, the occasional synchronous backend. Um, yeah, so uh, greenlets have the advantage, uh, have all of the advantages of the kind of generator approach, but um, uh, yeah, to, to sum it up, um, these things are very light. They're, the stack, stack frames in Python are, um, are on the heap. Uh, so yeah, uh, need to hurry through some stuff. Um, yeah, no code changes. Well, oh, so it works on Windows, so I didn't mention that. Um, a disadvantage is that uh, it doesn't work on Python 3 at this time. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big downer for some people. Um, there is a Python 3 branch. Uh, I, or, uh, yeah, there's a Python 3 fork. Um, I don't, I've not tried it. Um, it's, it's obviously sort of usable for some things, but um, that's not finished. But, but then, we're talking about networking operations, so uh, if you want to write a network server in Python 2 that shunts bytes around, around and use Python 3 for your user-facing stuff and do async, uh, use async I.O. or use uh, synchronous I.O. just for that component, that's, uh, that's something that might work for you. Um, and wherever we have locks, uh, we have the, ability, the, the, the possibility of deadlocks, but that may exist in other uh, async frameworks as well. Um, so, one pitfall, the biggest pitfall, is doing something that actually, actually blocks instead of doing this fake blocking where we yield to the event loop. Um, so if you're using any C libraries, they probably do this, and you have to modify the library or um, use any async support in that library and wrap it up into the G-Event programming model to avoid blocking. Um, and likewise, if you keep the CPU busy, you'll never yield to any other Greenlit, so this isn't at all for CPU-bound uh, activities. But you can, you could obviously use the ability of the, the, the networking uh, features of G-Event to delegate to synchronous backends that are doing heavy lifting and return it through your, your sort of network plumbing applications written in G-Event. Um, so I mentioned using one Greenlit per direction. Uh, you don't want to try and merge these two into one greenlet. You want to do writing in one greenlet and reading in, in one greenlet because you only want to block in one place at a time. So in the, the writer, you're actually blocking waiting for a message and blocking uh, sending that message, but you're, you're not blocked on anything important at any particular time. Um, you can obviously use this with multiprocessing, um, and that's a kind of approach that's used in uh, Java and Go and Rust, so you, th these these systems do have green threads and, and uh, greenlets, but they use multiple threads underneath them. In Python, we'd have to use processes underneath them, um, but uh, uh, you can still get more scalability out of multiprocessor systems by using this approach on multiple processes. Um, and then uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when I was doing this really heavily, uh, I wrote a micro framework, which uh, I think I gave a lightning talk 
uh, a couple of years ago saying, never write a microframework. It was a really stupid idea. But, but there is one. So uh, if you want to do G-Event with a, a RESTful G-Event and uh, a green Postgres driver that uh, can do, so the, your database operations also do this uh, uh, fake blocking kind of thing. Then that's built into to Nucleon, and uh, in in sort of uh, uh, revulsion at Pika and all of that callback stuff, I wrote uh, an AMQP library that was actually forked from another one called Puka. But so uh, there is a whereas most of the AMQP drivers try to be asynchronous uh, through callbacks, uh, this gives you a completely synchronous programming model. So uh, remote queues can be exposed as local queues and you just iterate through the messages of a queue um, or yeah, loop over getting messages from a queue rather than having a callback call every time uh, a, a message is available um, and, and all of the other AMQP operations as well. Um, so that's, that's that. Do we have time for questions? Uh, we have five minutes for questions, roughly. Uh, if anybody wants to leave to go to another room, to another session, and doesn't have a question, uh, we would appreciate it if we could be beforehand. So you have you know, some, some piece for the question. Uh, otherwise, if you have a question, there's the mic. Uh, just like. Well, this is more a comment than a question, but we're skipping over that part real fast. But G-Event only uses the select system call on all operating systems, which gives suboptimal performance on uh, other platforms like Windows, for uh, example. I, I don't actually. So, so somewhere in the heart of G-Event, it will use the, the most appropriate thing for any particular operating system. But no, not for, not for Windows, for Probably example. not for Windows, yeah. So you, it's, it's a horrible choice for cross-platform yeah scalability, but might be good if you know your target. I think it probably is possible to um, to adapt G-Event to be more Windows compatible because the the coroutines approach is is sort of completely abstract. Um, you could use it. Yeah, absolutely. But as of now, it uses a right. suboptimal system call on some platforms. Okay. So it might be worth knowing if you're okay. going to dabble in G-Event. Mm -hmm. I, in fairness, I've never used it on Windows, but I hear it works on Windows. No, so. me neither, but just <laughs> worth knowing. Yeah. Um, is there any optimal number of grill nets you can use in one process? Sorry, I can't hear you very well. Yeah. Okay. Is there any optimal number of grill nets you should use per one process, for example, or, or range, or um, how many grill nets should you start? How many workers? Uh, oh, workers? green lets. Oh, start yeah, as many green lets as you want. It's like just. Greenlets are very, very cheap, so create yeah. as many as you need. You can start with well, like, like 1,000? Yeah, 10,000 yeah. greenlets. Oh. Yeah, 100,000, who cares? Okay. As long you. as you've got memory. I have a question regarding uh, generators and coroutines. Um, if you use a, a generator, you yield if you have an asynchronous task to do, and you exactly know that between the yield and the resume, the global state or the shared state may change, and in a G event, you, you don't see obviously that, for example, time sleep may, may uh, suspend your, your green light and the state may be different when you wake up again, so. Um, I, yeah, well, so that's something to be, to be careful of in all of the async frameworks that you can't really rely on global state. Something that is useful about GEvent is that it has its own thread local object. Um, so the, and the monkey patch uh, approach will apply that thread local object as the, the threading dot local. Um, so that means that you can have your local state in a thread local object. And I think Flask uses thread locals or something like that. So um, with monkey patching, uh, the, the Flask global stuff should work. Uh, although I don't think I've ever tried that. So um, yeah, but obviously it's something to be careful about using global state when you're, um, you're using uh, anything concurrent. Thanks. Uh, so if, if G-Event was ported to Python 3, could it be uh, compatible with async I.O. 
for example, could we use some library in that scenario that's written in the async IO mm. style? Um, I suspect you probably can, yeah. Uh, so uh, async IO is completely within uh, Python. It's, it doesn't have any special Python tricks, whereas this, this one C trick in Gevent uh, and, and similar systems uh, with coroutines where you could jump to a different stack. Um, so that anything within, completely within Python could potentially run on uh, Gevent. But I think the big hope uh, for AsyncIO is that the event loop in AsyncIO will come to be the standard event loop for everything, including something like GEvent. So you could yeah. run uh, an AsyncIO uh, event loop and uh, have GEvent use that as its event loop, meaning that uh, all of the frameworks like Twisted and Tornado and GEvent and AsyncIO could all be uh, using you know, running on exactly the same code. As it is at the moment, you could probably use, because as I said, uh, select is, is one of the things that's patched, you could probably use Tornado and Twisted, um, their own event loops within Gevent. But actually bringing everything together is, a, is an open problem. Okay, thanks. Hello. Uh, do you have any idea on when uh, Gevent will be ported to Python 3? Because, you know, I think it's a very important, you know, dependency for a lot of projects, like hundreds of thousands of projects. And uh, with Twisted, you know, I think it's one of the, those dependencies which needs to be ported right, oh. right now, you know. I, so you have any I, estimate I, on when? Uh, so Gevent has only just reached version 1 uh, at, uh, it was in November last year that it reached version 1.0. Um, and I don't know how much uh, effort is going into to writing uh, a Python 3 compatible Gevent. So uh, yeah, no answer for that. But if you're interested in it, get involved. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? OK, thanks. Uh, thank you. It was a very insightful presentation. I would like to ask you, uh, where I work, we use Tornado for production and asynchronous Python. Sorry, I didn't, didn't hear that. It's a bit, bit noisy. Sorry? Where Tornado. I, where I work, we use Tornado uh, as asynchronous Python, and it works really well, just like Gevent. I myself used Gevent in the past. The problem is that um, we found a really hard bottleneck, and that is the database because the database, we couldn't find an, an asynchronous ORM. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so it's a huge problem for us. We don't want yeah. to use inline queries. So do you have any idea of an asynchronous ORM or one that's being developed? Or? Um, so there are ways around it. If you want to do uh, synchronous operations, you can use uh, an actual thread pool or something like that. So wrap up the synchronous code with uh, or, or a multiprocessing pool so that you're passing uh, the requests uh, using Gevent and receiving the responses using Gevent, but you only have, say, four blocking workers that are doing database calls. Um, that's, that's one way around it. I think, I, so I've, in Nucleon, I found a way of, or somebody had already written an example code for how to do, how to make the Postgres uh, uh, Psycho PG2 driver uh, uh, coroutine compatible um, by uh, having the library itself tell you when it wants to block and then you are responsible for doing that kind of blocking. So uh, it is possible for some drivers, but there are, and, and there are workarounds for others. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>